I was in high school, 15, 10th grade, oblivious, totally unaware of the curse that had been bestowed upon me. I remember very clearly where it first happened. I was at home, watching the news, and then I saw it. Paul Newman had died. I didn't read the newspaper. I didn't have a phone back in 2008. Unless you count a crappy call and text only Nokia. So it was the first I'd heard of it. Have you ever felt like your throat swells up when you cry? Have you ever choked, uh, even momentarily? Imagine those two things simultaneously, but somehow unlike either one. It was strange. It is strange, and I still find it difficult to describe outside losing an allergy. When I saw the story on TV, I started choking, or my throat swelled up, or an invisible demon wrapped an arm around my neck. Take your pick. At the time, I wasn't sure what was wrong with me, but I wasn't concerned because the sensation was painless and went away after a couple of minutes. Well, before my mom called me to dinner and my father grumbled about work. The next morning, I woke up in real discomfort, this time edging into pain that I can only equate to bronchitis, that raw feeling you get in your throat from a virus spreading its clones inside your body. I wanted to see the nurse at school, since I was otherwise fine, my teacher didn't believe me. So I went on my lunch break, of my own volition, evading teachers and hall monitors under the guise of a bathroom break. The nurse didn't know what I was sick with, only that I was definitely sick. She called my mom, and I was taken home for the day. Fortunately, my father worked, so he didn't have to pick me up. That would not have gone down well. My mom was the typical, worried-filled, sympathetic parent, doting about my pain and asking what soup I wanted and if she could do anything else for me while I recovered. As it was, my father berated me when he got back that day. What are you sick with? He asked me, point blank, the moment he walked through the door and made his way up to my room. I, I don't know, Dad, I told him. He grunted. Well... You're never sick. You're not trying to skip school, are you? Uh, no way. I was not that kind of student, and he knew it. But he loved accusing me whenever he could. I have a quiz tomorrow, and the nurse said I should stay out until at least Thursday. He cocked his head, turned around, and then turned back and looked at me with a sudden anger. The kind he reserved for a bad test score, or, God forbid, a lunch detention. You better not be messing with me, he said, his voice deadly quiet. I'm not, I said. I'm not sure how I kept my voice even. His look might have made a bear piss itself. He paused, considered, nodded, and finally he left me alone. I did not sleep well that night, but it was not because of him. I was uncomfortable again. I don't understand why that incident, uh, the death of Paul Newman, affected me like it did. Uh, random celebrity deaths are only minor discomforts to me now. Uh, mass deaths, like shootings, affect me more. But the symptoms are temporary. My guess is that it was my first experience. Simple as that. No reason other than the disease introducing itself, planting its roots, and shocking my system before I adjust it. I was bedridden with a fever and returned to school the following Tuesday. At that point, I'd missed a quiz and about two dozen homework assignments. I don't like getting behind. Uh, who does? So I was upset, to say the least. My friend, Brady, thought I was still sick. That's how nervous I was. My doctor wasn't sure what was wrong with me. My throat was swollen like I had bronchitis, but that doesn't usually mean fever. He told me it was the flu. It was a reasonable diagnosis, and he never could have known the true cause. That sickness constituted the most time I ever missed in high school. I did have the flu uh, later that year, uh, the real flu, and I only missed two days. I guess you could say I'm resilient. I don't get sick. I don't let exhaustion or stress get in the way of my work. 
unless that sickness involves death. What happened to you? Brady asked the day I got back. He gave the kind of grin usually reserved for a little kid. Innocent. Mischievous. You pissed the bed? Something like that. I told him. You are okay, right? Brady's face became stone. He was always like that, even in high school. He could joke around with you one second and then become more serious than a funeral director. Sure, I said. I believed it at the time. There was no real reason to think my flu had been anything but a fluke. No one avoided getting the flu in high school. Not even me. I was okay, in a physical sense. I didn't know what had happened. That revelation would not come until years later. The freedom of adulthood merged with the responsibilities, read none, of childhood, all mashed up into a party-filled drunken stupor, is what some remember as college. I enjoyed it, sure, but I wasn't an English or phys ed major. I wanted to be a chemist. Uh, people who haven't done STEM don't understand just how rigorous it can be. I've taken English classes, and they require work. can even be confusing at times, but you never stare at a book and say, What the hell is this? You never struggle for hours with a single problem, wanting to rip the head off of your professor and chunking it into sulfuric acid. You never find yourself buried in your notes at four in the morning, despite keeping up with your studies. I had fun. I went to a couple parties, but my focus was always on my coursework. Brady had teased me about that in high school. He often told me to get my books out of my rear end, and I suppose he had a point, because he made a good living as an electrician after going through trade school. He didn't struggle, didn't want to bash his head against a wall before a physical chem exam. And maybe that's why it took me so long to understand. I kept my head in the sand went through the motions, made friends, but none that I kept in touch with later. I went to clubs that padded my resume, but were not exactly fun. Throughout all of that, I swallowed death. Celebrity death. I thought something was stuck in my throat. Mass shooting. Sharp pain in my throat the morning after, like I'd screamed until it was raw. Family members. My great-aunt died right before my 19th birthday, and I really did get bronchitis. The doctor tested for it. Not that it was the real cause of my pain. It's so obvious to me now. Back then, I didn't understand. I didn't connect the dots because there were no dots. Only random points in space. Like stars that didn't quite form constellations. Far-off masses that, to my eyes, were no more than specks not even visible beyond the clouds. I met Caroline that summer. I was doing an intramural soccer program. She did track. We hit it off instantly. I can't exactly say why. Uh, we didn't have much in common. Our majors were different. Our hobbies were different. I barely managed intramural sports while she could run a mile in about five minutes. I didn't deserve her from the start. She was beautiful in every sense. The type of person that volunteers at dog shelters, not for her resume, but because she loved animals. I have no idea what she saw in me. I was a gangly 19-year-old college kid. A, a nerd. My personality droll compared to her own. She was the one to ask me out on a date. About a month after we first met. She took me to a little hole-in-the-wall burger place that served fries dripping with grease on scratched plastic plates. We talked about a lot of stuff that I don't remember. Most of it's inconsequential. News, the latest student gossip, crazy stories from our brief time spent on campus. I remember telling her about a guy that pissed on another girl at a party. She told me how she'd pissed herself once. And I found that so hilarious that I was crying from laughter. We didn't only talk about the mundane. After that first date, we delved into politics. Fortunately, there was no friction there. Uh, philosophy, plans after college, and beyond. I, of course, wanted to be a chemist. 
as she planned on becoming a nurse. It would have been the perfect job for her. She was radiant, could bring energy into a room of depressed, sleep-deprived college students. She already volunteered at a hospital. When a friend of mine from high school was paralyzed in a skiing accident, she came with me to visit him six hours away, and I think she talks to him more than I did. She wasn't just on the same wavelength as me. We were linked as if by quantum entanglement, inseparable across infinite distance. Talking to her was easier than talking to my mom. Sex with her was pure ecstasy, like an injection of pure morphine, and it wasn't because she was my first. To this day, I hadn't had an experience like I did with Carolyn. We dated for nine months, up until her death. My parents loved her. My father didn't care. He only paid attention to my grades and my future career. My mom gushed to her friends about the lovely young woman I'd met. Brady said she was a smoke show. I punched him in the gut for that one. When she was killed by a drunk driver, something in me broke. Something that hasn't fully healed since. I hadn't had a girlfriend in high school, unless you count a couple movie dates and prom. I wasn't outgoing, and I hadn't had the guts to even ask Carolyn on a date in the first place. She was killed the day after I finished finals that fall, two days before her last exam. I don't remember much, only going home and sulking in my room, alone, browsing YouTube videos about people laughing while I cried, shaking off my mom even as she tried to comfort me and yelled at her for it hurting her as much as I hurt myself. My father came to visit that weekend, the first one after Carolyn's death and the day before her funeral. He smiled, gave me a hug, and tried his best to show his support. I treated him like an outcast. He wasn't the worst dad in the world, but he never cared about anything except my schoolwork, had never expressed interest in Carolyn. And since his divorce with my mom the year prior, he had essentially checked out of our lives, just doing the bare minimum by paying for my education. My mom said she stuck with him for my own sake. He made the money and did work around the house and carried the weight that no child support could. He never abused her, and he didn't abuse me either. He just didn't care about me. My mom was the type to save a stray puppy on the road, my father would have kicked it to the curb, wouldn't have even bothered calling animal control. I was indifferent to him, and somehow he understood. I'll give him that much. When it was clear that I had no intention to reconnect, certainly not at a time like this, he backed off. He left and didn't come back, except for holidays and family gatherings. He was pleasant enough at those, I just couldn't get past the cold, judgmental man from my childhood. I'm old enough now to know that people change. Back then, I wanted to cut him out of my life forever. The funeral was awful. Carolyn's parents cried on each other. Her family was beside themselves. The minister had trouble making it through the service. At least, that's what I was told. He might have had trouble because of me, but... I doubt it. Carolyn wasn't the kind of person you forget, even if she hadn't been active at her church. The minister couldn't care less about me in comparison. I tuned it out. I tried to block my emotions because I'm not an emotional guy. Word of advice to anyone who loses a loved one. Talk to people. Share your feelings. And definitely don't withdraw from your social circles. The minister had just started talking. That's the last thing I remember. I felt like someone had wrapped an arm around my neck. My vision wavered. And within a minute or so, I had blacked out. The doctors called it shock. My professors told me to take a couple weeks off before the next semester. My mom cared for me like I was her infant son again. Only I knew the truth and I had been introduced to it in the worst possible way. I swallowed death. 
if it's minor, impersonal, if it's a mere discomfort, if a lot of people die, I have temporary pain. If it's someone close to me, it hits like a truck, and I'm out of it for days, if not weeks. Because of how it occurred, everyone bought into my diagnosis. The grief, of course, was not why I blacked out. It wasn't why I coughed up blood that evening, or why I could have sworn someone took a potato peeler to my throat those next few days. I stopped watching the news after I returned to school. I tried to stay away from death in all forms. If I don't know about it, death doesn't affect me. Otherwise, I would die myself, as millions around the world perish. So I withdrew as much as I could. My college friends tried to stay in touch. I pushed away. Brady reached out. He was halfway across the country, finishing up his own schooling, but he was willing to fly over if it would help my mental health. He asked me, like he had asked years before, if I was okay. This time I didn't lie. I gave him a flat no. I'll come out then, he said. You need some support. I don't go back to school for three weeks. I had already planned to tell him no before he asked. You can't do that, I said. The plane ticket's too expensive. To hell with the plane ticket, man. This is your life we're talking about. I told you about my apprenticeship, right? I have money. His parents wouldn't help him out. His mom had overdosed, and his dad could barely pay for his education. So he went on his own. I wasn't going to make him burn what little he'd saved. Don't be stupid, I told him. You can just talk to me over the phone. He agreed in the end. He'd never do something I didn't want. He couldn't have known, of course, that I would only call him once in the next three months, and that I'd not kept him away out of kindness. I hadn't wanted to face him, or anyone for that matter. I wanted solitude. It took me a long time to come out of my shell. I did, eventually. Just in time for the final stage of my condition. By the time I graduated, I was back to what could be called normal. As it often does, though, the shadow of loss lingered over me, like the shadows that appear every morning and evening. It took me a long time to come to terms with Carolyn's death. Not just because of what I had learned, but because of the event itself. Mostly the event. I can't ignore what it unleashed, though. I had been made aware of a curse that I had to endure alone. If I told anyone, they would call me insane, or I'd have to go to more therapy like I did after I passed out at the funeral. I didn't want that. I had a change of heart at some points and shifted to education instead of pure science. I became a high school teacher. It doesn't make any sense why I wanted to do that. Deal with people that didn't care about moles or redox reactions, but life is strange. Maybe Carolyn rubbed off on me and I wanted to help people in what little way I could. I enjoyed it. I returned to the dating scene almost five years after Carolyn died. The relationships were rough. I was inexperienced, I wasn't committed, and my past still loomed over me every time I kissed a woman or laid against her breath. None of them ever can be. I should have gone back to therapy, but I was afraid of telling too much and ending up in a psych ward. My mother was proud of my career, Glad that I'd found my calling, and doubly glad that I'd gotten away from the gloom that had enveloped my sophomore and junior years of college. She would have been dismayed to know that I hadn't. That I had just learned to compartmentalize and accept, but that I still cried every few weeks for no reason. She didn't know that my girlfriends meant no more to me than work colleagues, or that I had no friends besides Brady outside of work. It did not help that I continued swallowing death. It got worse, like a physical disease. Each time I inevitably heard about a celebrity death, uh, when my grandparents died, 
when my aunt succumbed to cancer and my cousin was killed in Afghanistan, it started wearing on me. I had to take days off of school, both for my physical and mental health. I tried to make it a regular, only staying home two or three times a year, but that became impossible. I went to see my doctor. I went through all sorts of screenings, and nothing came back positive. She knew about my past. She knew how hard I'd been affected by Carolyn's death. Still, that could not explain the almost continual rawness of my throat, or how I'd coughed up a pint of blood after my cousin's death. I was referred to a hospital, where more doctors probed me and more questions remained unanswered. In my fourth year of teaching, I was constantly tired, unable to do much more than go to class and grade tests before I collapsed on my couch. My pathetic dating life fizzled out. There hadn't been much there to begin with. My mom called me constantly wanting to know if the doctors had figured out the source of my fatigue and sore throats and depression. The depression, of course, had an obvious cause, though I couldn't tell anyone about it. Brady, bless his soul, came to visit me despite living in California when I was still stuck in Wisconsin. He didn't bring his wife. Guys' nights, he called them. We pulled out an Xbox and played Halo and the original Call of Duty games and all the others we remembered from our childhoods. We drank beer and watched movies and talked about our lives. I was brutally honest with him. He didn't judge. He listened, uh, nodded, offered his support. It came out unintentionally after I'd had one too many butts. I told him about my condition my real condition. He didn't doubt me for a second. You believe it? I asked him, my words coming out slippery, like I'd shoved soap in my mouth. He nodded. He wasn't drunk. He's 6'3 and could down a bottle of vodka without losing his balance. Of course I do, he said. But it's crazy. He smiled. Life's crazy, man. I know what happened to you. With... Uh, um... He didn't need to say it. Anyway, I know what you've told me, too. Your fatigue and everything. You believe me? I had to hear it again from him. I couldn't believe it myself, at the time. I've known you for fifteen years, Jack. He leaned forward, his eyes intense. His muscles taut. I can tell when you're lying, even when you're drunk. And you're not lying. He's the only person to this day who knows what is wrong with me. I never had the guts to tell him in the first place. The alcohol made me. I couldn't have told my mom, because knowledge of my suffering would have destroyed her. In the end, it didn't much matter. The diagnosis was unexpected, to say the least. She was 61, and never smoked, ate healthy, exercised. Yet, she had lung cancer, and by the time it was detached, it had metastasized. She died a year and a half after that diagnosis. She lasted longer than most, from what I've been told. She was fortunate to have made it for so long. I felt about as fortunate as a political refugee. I felt like my life had been unraveling ever since that first time I swallowed death. Two days after my mom's funeral, I stopped breathing. It wasn't instantaneous. I felt my throat swelling up and managed to call 911 before I passed out. When I woke up, I was intubated and unable to breathe on my own. I was conscious, which surprised the doctors almost more than my condition itself. They didn't know why my throat had ballooned and then deflated, leaching blood like a sponge, or why my lungs had failed when they were right there, fully intact and healthy. Brady rushed over as soon as he heard the news. He understood. He grabbed my hand and told me that I'd make it. I responded with my phone, 
telling him that was ridiculous. Brady, always the realist, amended his statement and said that I had to enjoy what little life I had left. What is there to enjoy? I wrote. Everyone I love is dead. What more can I get out of life? Life is always worth living, he told me. You never know what might come next, and you have people that care about you. I couldn't laugh, but I smiled. I care about you, Jack, he said. I don't want you to die. Is this really better than death? I asked him, living on a ventilator until someone else dies and pushes me over the edge. You don't know when that'll happen, he said. It could be in one year or ten. Hell, you could live longer than me. People like you have lived perfectly good lives. I knew what he meant. Stephen Hawking, Christopher Reeve, Helen Keller. People make fun of her, but she really was a remarkable woman. They had lived through worse. I can still move and see and write. I just can't talk or leave my hospital bed. Not that it matters. My health insurance covers most of my care and everyone. Brady, uh, previous co-workers, friends of friends, have chipped in. I won't have a problem with money unless I do outlive Brady. Brady missed his calling. He should have been a therapist or maybe a guidance counselor. I'm not sure how much longer I have. I was confined to a hospital bed seven months ago. I'm still doing well, physically at least. The doctors are just as confused as they were before, but thrilled at my overall health. I eat and breathe through tubes, but find that I don't really care about that anymore. I used to be afraid of a moment like this, when my condition would take me to my own death. I find now that I do not fear what will come. I've lived as well as I could struggling through tragedy and pain of all kinds, and managed to make a living despite it all. It seems that people do care about me, because the donations and visits haven't stopped. That is what I missed all those years ago, when I withdrew and never quite came out of my shell. We must value life instead of mourn death, celebrate those we have lost and those who still live. You can't forget about the dead, but dwindling on their fates is just as dangerous as the physical condition that I have now. It can destroy you. Maybe what I have isn't a curse. In the past months, I have come to appreciate what I have, despite all that has been taken away. I don't think I ever would have come to that conclusion myself.